Happy holiday season. And thank you so much for dedicating your time today to join Ovagin webinars. In a few minutes, we will start with the session. But prior to that, let me introduce our today's speakers. My great and professional colleague, Birol Oedin, whom you already know very well from all Ovagin's previous webinars and education videos, which you always may find at Ovagin website and our YouTube channel. And today, Birol will talk about unique service of Ovagin Donor Bank, genetically certified oocyte. But even a greater pleasure for me today is to introduce to all the audience our invited speaker, a world leader in cytogenetics, a scientific researcher with over 30 years of career, a president of the International Chromosome and Genome Society, Professor Darren Griffin. Professor Griffin played a significant role in the development of the Carrier Mapping, a universal test for genetic disease in IVF, co-authored over 200 scientific publications in reproduction and evolution, and may share with us even his insight into the karyotypes on dinosaurs and started writing in Ukrainian already. So I'm sure a talk will be exciting. And finally, prior to starting, I would like to say good afternoon to many of you who are connected from Ukraine. Good morning to our colleagues from Brazil, Argentina, USA, and Canada. Good evening to you at Singapore, Japan, Philippines. And of course, good afternoon again to our colleagues from Europe. We have many from Italy, Spain, Austria, Ireland, and UK connected. For those who don't know me, I am Dr. Uliana Dorofaeva, a medical director and scientific advisor at Ovogen Donor Bank. And my professional career, except other areas of interest, is already for 16 years dedicated to the global OSI donation. And we are starting finally, and I would like to invite Birol to share his presentation. Thank you very much for kind introduction and invitation. Okay, I guess we are ready now. Yeah. Uh, okay, like uh, today we will try to talk about our unique service as a origin egg bank, uh, polar body NGS testing through the donor oocytes as we are uh, trying to manage euploid the rate of oocytes. So we are trying to give to our customers uh, services as a euploid oocyte with the uh, NGS testing. Uh, of course, before before to choose of which oocyte we are going to the NGS testing, of course, we have a uh, really strict morphological assessment for the oocyte quality. As we are checking the cumulus corona cell quality and composition and cytoplasmic activity and morphology, perivital and space, the first polar body quality as it's important for morphological and genetical potential, uh, the zona pellucida thickness and morphology, spindle localization and determination, and also artificial intelligence base of the morphological assessment, which we are doing all oocyte morphological assessment by the artificial intelligence base. So uh, how artificial intelligence we are adapted for the morphological oocyte selection. While artificial intelligence has a two different dynamics and platform, First platform is getting direct information from the morphological assessment of all sites. As I said, a different parameter measuring the polar body, size of polar body, localization of the polar body, size of spindle or localization of the spindle, uh, as perivital in space, how large it is, thickness of zona pellucida, bright fringes of zona pellucida, which is really important and effective for the fertilization, especially for the blastocyst rate. Also from another side, which are coming clinical information of the egg donor. So even if we have a many of the oocytes, while we are getting average 20 major, 15 to 20 major from each donor, so we can make all morphological assessment in a short time and all together with the uh, group of the oocytes. Well, when we catch the uh, image of the oocytes or video, we can do that by the two way. The first way, like we can use, of course, time-lapse incubator, but it's a quite difficult for uh, morphological selection of the oocytes while we are not culturing same as embryo. But we can 
this active time-lapse camera, which is advantage of our system. So active time-lapse camera has a special fiber optic cable, which is directly affecting even for the cytoplasmic maturation part of it, and also is a measuring the different parameter in a short time. And then we are getting as a graphic or we have a reference value for each parameter and system is comparing with our reference, um, reference numbers to uh, morphological assessment of the all sites. While system has a different uh, prisma, so it's getting a different image in the same time, like in a minute we can get hundred of the image and system can use as a time-lapse image, as a time-lapse video. And it gives really high sensitivity and accuracy, like almost around 80%, which is really high for the morphological selection of the all sites. But in the same time, when we get the information from uh, the donor egg, morphological information, of course, from background, we need clinical information as well. So how many times this donor donated? How was the previous cycle efficiency as a blastocyst rate, a pregnancy rate, maturation rate, uh, quality one oocyte rate? So all this information is a collecting what, with the main computer. So we are getting a final decision, which we will get a freezing. So after that assessment. But still, uh, even if we have high quality of the oocytes, of course, there are safety issues we have to consider during the vitrification and warming process. As you know, that for the vitrification, we are using uh, high cryoprotectant uh, composition, and then it can affect the membrane permeability, also hardening of the zona pellucida. Uh, it can affect the meiotic spindle, depolymerization, also cytoplasmic activity of the oocyte can get damaged so it can look more granulated as polar body may get a degeneration or disappear. It's a quite often happening like uh, after the warming, you may not see the first polar body. Also, uh, of course, oocyte impact of oocyte physiology may affect during the vitrification. This is the main algorithm for the oocyte selection by the artificial intelligence. As I said, the morphological specification and clinical information is coming together, and then we are finalizing which oocyte is the best for us. Uh, still, we are considering also different parameters as a metabolic parameters, also vacuole as smooth endoplasmic reticulum, uh, as I said, cytoplasmic granulation, which is also affecting uh, quality of warming, especially, and zona pellucida bright fringes. So this is a typical algorithm of measurement, like automatic measurement of the oocyte, uh, donor oocytes. So uh, when we find out different parameters, so which is not in, inside of our reference range, of course, we avoid them for the egg banking. So we use them only for fresh cycle for the fertilization. And the final, which for each egg load, we are choosing the number of all sites and just system automatically uh, measuring each of them. And if system find any kind of defect on the morphological defect on the all site, it's just avoid this for the egg banking. This is the, how we are giving like reference value for the system. So according to this reference is making a mathematical calculation for the different parameters of the all sites as as you see here, like uh, darkness of the all sites, all plasma, first polar body, pervitalin space, and of also zona pellucida thickness. Uh, when we make the meiotic spindle determination, actually it helps a lot. Uh, while as you know, meiotic spindle localization is not almost an exact place. So mostly when you check the, on the spindle view, uh, you will find very close to polar body or just under the polar body or like a six o'clock position. But still, according to our experience, 10 to 15% of all sites is a really very close to three o'clock position, which most of the embryologists uh, prefer to make uh, fertilization, I mean ICSI. So that's why uh, possible spindle damage also risk for us. And that's why we are trying to use myotic spindle determination prior vitrification to avoid this risk as well. And we are getting such live image through the time-lapse, uh, which is connected directly 
spindle software to artificial intelligence and the time-lapse dynamic camera. So we can get a live image. When you talk to all sides, we are giving you this live image exactly, if you, of course, prefer to get this service. And then you may directly find out, even if you don't have this software, you may find out where is the spindle uh, and you will use a different lo localization, different uh, location for the fertilization. So uh, after the freezing and towing also, there are interesting issue while uh, when you don't see the spindle before vitrification, when you tow the all sites, there are two risks. Uh, first risk, uh, for the cleavage arrest, mostly embryo is developing till day, day three and then just stop to develop and you don't receive blastocyst. It's quite often for the frozen egg, which you can see. So one of the big reasons is the visibility of the polar body. Either all side go to post-maturation or uh, like just you have a missing of time between the trigger and fertilization. To avoid all this risk, of course, that to use Myotic spindle determination is an advantage. As I said, that like system can be used by the uh, fertilization. I mean, if we show you exactly place of the meiotic spindle, you may not uh, damage the meiotic spindle during fertilization. Uh, if we talk about the first polar body in the all site, of course, the first polar body is the real signal of nuclear maturation. So that's why first polar body uh, can be important to de detect for the unemployed rate of the all site. The first polar body in human uh, remains intact more than 20 hours after the ovulation. So that's why also uh, timing is so important for us for the polar body biopsy of the all sides. So when we get the donor egg pickup, uh, after one hour immediately we are doing denudation and we have to do immediately uh, biopsy while we don't want to miss the time because after warming you should still wait two, three hours and then you need to fertilize. Just we are not uh, missing that time so which you will have the uh, stop uh, spermatid injection. And also uh, that is First polar body morphology give us info information, not just only for the nuclear maturation, also give also age of the oocyte, which is important. And according to different study, like uh, first polar body have strong correlation between first polar body morphology uh, and also uh, fertilization rate and embryo quality. So when you have the high quality of the first polar body, According to our experience as well, we have higher fertilization rate and embryo quality. And you when you find out abnormal or larger de de degenerated polar body, then fertilization rate just decrease. And also there is exactly not direct uh, correlation between a pronuclear morphology and embryo quality, which is also important. And which we find out also important when polar body Morphology is fine. Mostly we are getting, of course, uh, high uh, DNA signal and embryo oocyte mostly getting from the donor euploid. Uh, how we are doing a technically polar body biopsy, of course, it's a sensitive process while still you should open a small hole with the laser hatching on the zona pellucida and you should enter inside. This can look like a quite big traumatic, but it's not going like that. Uh, as you see, like how you should keep the uh, position of the biopsy pipettes. So uh, when you go to directly with the small hole of the zona pellucida, so it's quite easy to remove a polar body. And after that, is it in a one hour actually, like you may not able to see exactly this hole so easy. So it's a just starting to disappear and cover itself. When you see on the video, I will try to move, uh, just as an example, how we are doing the polar body biopsy, we are opening a hole as a line, and then uh, we are just trying to, you can use a different kind of biopsy pipette, a spike or non-spike. So both of them are giving a good result actually, depends of your experience. Just with, you should be a patient and try to just 
enter like a directly to first part of the polar body and wait near the polar body and slowly aspirate. So you may not give any damage to polar body, of course, and this polar body will give a good uh, NGS signal, DNA signal. So why we are doing a polar body biopsy and testing? So the idea of the performing PGD with the use of polar body, so actually uh, we are using first polar body and of course also can be used a second polar body uh, because of by the products of the female meiosis and allowing the prediction of the resulting genotype of the maternal contribution to the embryos. And by using polarization microscopy have shown that some oocyte presenting a first polar body uh, may still be in a telophyse and also between a spindle and the first polar body of oocyte, there is presence of the connection. And when we are doing the polar body, so when the spindle bridge is present for only a limited time of period, which is usually one or two hours after the first polar body appear, we are using this gap and of the quick biopsy or micromanipulation, we are just aspirating the polar body and according to quality of the oocyte as a morphological quality of oocyte and spindle, we are sending this for NGS testing. And spindle determination is here the key factor for the polar body biopsy. While uh, zona pellucida laser hatching can give us the limited manipulation while we are opening really uh, low amount in the zona pellucida. And the main target to remove polar body without damage and keep the oocyte morphology totally compact after 30 minutes from the biopsy. So when we finish the biopsy, after 30 minutes, we find out oocyte well survived and we are ready to vitrification process. So polar body analysis also will distinguish whether the oocyte carries the normal or affected alleles. So this is the idea why we are testing the first polar body. The state of corresponding embryo will be determined by the paternal allele and this can be normal, unaffected carrier or affected. Still, we have to know if even uh, in the donor oocytes, 20 to 25% of the donor oocytes will be unemployed with a different reason. And one of the unique features of the female gamete is that polar bodies can provide beneficial information about the genetic background of the oocyte uh, also, polar body biopsy has been applied in pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to detect chromosomal or genetic abnormalities. So the exciting role of the polar bodies is the emerging with the development of the uh, genome-wide single cell sequencing te technologies. So polar body testing may only give a big advantage to avoid mitochondrial mutation uh, risk while we are fertilizing and euploid oocytes. So when you fertilize the, because mostly you are ordering like six or eight oocytes, which is limited for patient. And of course you are targeting to get at least two, three blastocysts, but of course it's difficult to test them for everyone. So while a low number of eggs, low number of blastocysts to, to, to make a risk and to make biopsy them as an trophectoderm biopsy and to test them, okay, that is not a realistic idea. Uh, that's why, like, we are creating a such idea. We can give you euploid oocyte, which I will share statistic in the next slides. So you will see, you will increase the chance of euploid embryo rate. So polar body does not impact the morphokinetic parameters of the embryo development. That's why, even if we remove the polar body, you will not see any influence for the uh, pregnancy rate, implantation rate, or embryo, embryo development rate. And a polar body biopsy can be safely applied without the risk of impairing the reproductive potential of the embryo. According to studies, like studies shows, the removal of the blastomer or the polar body does not affect, uh, give negative effect for the embryo viability. And another study shows like impact of the polar body biopsy for the morphokinetic activity and they find out that there is no uh, any negative effect or risk for the morphokinetic activities of the embryo development after the polar body uh, biopsy and PGD testing. 
And another study shows there are also zona pellucid that dr drilling during polar body biopsy and micro manipulation do not affect the oocyte quality, survival rate, and blastocyst outcome. Here you can see like uh, euploid, unemployed, and control group on the donor oocytes after the PGS testing. So it's, they are going to quite parallel as you see, like uh, the limit, little bit of difference between euploid and unemployed rate, while uh, most of the donor oocyte normally is getting euploid. But we have also experience when we sent from the donor which even already tested fertility proven and in the previous cycle give a uh, quite big number of blastocysts, but in the individual cycle, it's give high unemployed rate. For example, 15 oocytes, I remember when we were testing out of 15, 11 were unemployed. So it's still possible. As algorithm of the genetic screening, we are using NGS-based unemployed screening for donor oocyte, NGS-based carrier screening of the oocyte donor, and targeted pattern or risk gene analysis. So uh, when we do the polar body biopsy for the CGH array, and we use the same uh, configuration as the impact of the chromosomal disorder. So what does the oocyte genetic error mean and how we detect it? A genetic error in the oocyte uh, that just occur as a result of the meiotic uh, meiotic problem during the oogenesis. The polar body analysis is an important method to detecting these errors. So when we detect this error, actually we are increasing chance of the euploid embryo outcome as well. And why it is important to genetically screen the oocyte. The genetic structure of the oocyte directly affect, of course, pregnancy success. Unemployed embryos, of course, reduce pregnancy success and the live birth rate as well. So that chromosomal abnormalities as a such, such abnormality or uh, problem as a Down syndrome. So we avoid, of course, all of this risk and be minimized through the donor X and tested donor X. And analyze made from the polar body, uh, which is not directly affected when we remove the polar body uh, for the morphokinetic activities. As unemployed and oocyte yield, as you see, while age is increasing, of course, unemployed rate and rate of oocyte also increasing. But especially even in, in the donor cycles, it is surprising that for the some individual donor, unemployed rate could be really high. So what are the advantages of the polar body testing? So considering the problem of mosaicism, which is the major limitation of the embryo testing, of course, uh, the direct testing of all sites by the polar body analysis have a critical value in improving accuracy and real reliability of the selecting euploid embryo transfer. So this is a really important. And from another side, of course, polar body testing still provide a detection and also to transfer the majority of the unemployed embryos. So we avoid this risk. We are giving a more potential to transfer euploid embryos. This is only the first polar body analysis is sufficient and reliable. Of course, it's not like uh, we can detect a part of uh, information to the first polar body, but it doesn't mean like if we detect the first polar body, MPU should be uh, euploid 100%. Of course, will not be. There are still many different uh, effects. I mean, still male factor we have, still, of course, lab effect, the different contamination effects, and also, of course, metabolic, effect, metabolic effects. And what technology do we use for polar body testing? And what is the limitation of the test? We are using the following whole genome amplification for the first polar body uh, cells. And of course, we are performing unemployed screening using by NGS next generation sequencing. And NGS based analysis made from the first polar body is extremely reliable method for the PGTA examination of the all sites, according to studies. So if we check the unemployed rate, for the donor eggs, as you see, 20% of the donor eggs are getting unemployed. And a patient is increasing to 47. 
So for the different group, give the different unemployed rate. And another group, 30% of the donor oocytes give unemployed and on a patient 65%. So when we are talking to donor and patient, we are talking the similar age, similar age group. So still quite high uh, unemployed rate. And when you check the implantation and miscarriage rate, so for the donor uh, X, of course, we are waiting for the donor program, we are meeting much higher implantation rate than this one. So why this implantation rate is a low? This is the part of it why the, we are not testing embryo for the unemployed for the donor program. And that's why number of unemployed embryo is high. So that is the directly affect to implantation and miscarriage rate. So uh, if we come to our outcome for the NGS tested donor oocytes, so we have three different group with a different donor age, while 25 to 29, 30 to 32, and 19 to 24, uh, years old donor. So we tested almost up to 1,700 oocytes here. Uh, as you see, the number of oocytes, 1,836. So number of euploid oocytes from the donor, 1,377, around 27% of them come unemployed. Uh, after the, that is important information. So after the vitrification process at the towing rate really high, so almost 96% uh, of the oocytes survive even more. And the number of fertilized oocytes, as I said, polar body biopsy is not affecting fertilization rate and vitrification rate. And if we check number of euploid embryos through euploid oocyte is a 1,087 is a really big number. So if we check the percentage of euploid oocytes in the same group with the euploid day five and day six embryos, you will see for the 75% of the euploid oocyte from them, almost 71% of the euploid oocyte give a euploid blastocyst. So if we check the unemployed rate through euploid oocytes, it's only 24%. So from every 10 euploid oocytes, only two of them after the embryo preparation, let's say, embryo culturing, we find out unemployed. So this is really impressive. Uh, for the different group of the donor, still give very high survival rate, fertilization rate, and euploid blastocyst rate, which we are giving 10 of the oocytes in a egg load. So that means you may receive from the 10 of euploid oocytes almost, uh, if you have a good sperm parameter, of course, if you receive four or five blastocysts, like we are thinking, at least a three of them will be the euploid according to our statistics. If we check about the quality of the blastocyst through this, because while we are making a polar body biopsy, so let's see if there is effect of the morphokinetic activity of the blastocyst. But when we check the AA and AB quality of all sites, we find out really, really high percentage. And we, when we check BB and BC quality of all sites, really low percentage while uh, due of the sperm factors or lab factors. Well, advantage of the polar body testing from the patient perspective, so egg donation program mostly bring financial responsibilities for patient and each of egg looks at potential embryo for the patient perspective. And euploid potential oocyte have big chance to achieve good quality of euploid blastocyst. From another part, most of the egg donation program in different clinic does not require NGS or PGD testing before embryo transfer. So euploid oocyte potentially will give good option of the, for the patient. As a conclusion, uh, genetically tested oocyte is advanced technology, which may increase chance of euploid blastocyst outcome and pregnancy chance. Polar body biopsy does not affect oocyte morphology or survival rate, vitrification or towing rate or morphokinetic activities. Genetically tested, tested oocyte has significantly better euploid blastocyst and implantation outcome and chromosomal abnormality risk dramatically decreased after the polar body NGS testing. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Birol. This is very extremely interesting and professional presentation. And dear colleagues, if you have any questions, please type them and we will be happy to answer them after all our lectures. 
And so far, I would like to introduce again our invited expert, um, Professor Darren Griffin. Please, you can share your slide. I'm way ahead of you, uh, really. I've already done it, right? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful invitation. This is the second time I've not been in Kiev, and uh, I'm absolutely dying to, to be visiting you, you all at some point uh, in the future. I am going to tell you a little bit about aneuploidy, and as we have an emphasis on egg banking, uh, a little bit how we use polar bodies to study it. Uh, I have to say thank you to Birol for, uh, for that, um, uh, in many ways, an introduction to what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about pre-implantation genetic testing in general, but specifically for aneuploidy. I'm then going to go a little bit uh, off the wall here because I'm going to introduce you to two um, psychological terms that I think are very relevant to the study of PGTA. I'll talk about mosaicism, biopsy, the evidence base for PGTA, a little bit about randomized controlled trials and the role of the regulator, what we tell our patients, and then conclude a little bit of some of the things we might just agree upon. So let's start with the first of those. Aneuploidy is a leading cause of mental retardation, pregnancy loss, obstetric complications, uh, imprinting syndromes, infertility, and IVF failure. So um, it's really intuitive that we might want to not transfer aneuploid embryos. Um, it arises primarily in the first female meiotic division, which is uh, the result of which results in the formation of the first polar body. So in other words, polar body analysis from egg donors is a really very good way to uh, study the mechanisms of human aneuploidy. And one of the first places that we might wanna look here is that on the left, we have our classical idea of chromosomal non-disjunction um, and uh, with two chromosomes going to the same pole. Um, however, there's another mechanism that we call precocious separation. And a study that we did about 10 years ago now is that we use the analysis of first polar bodies to ask the question, which was the most predominant mechanism? And we could measure the relative levels of chromosome loss and chromatid loss and gain uh, through this approach. And although these are very messy traces compared to the NGS traces we can get now, the results were nonetheless very clear in that it told us that um, precocious separation or chromatid loss and gain was far more common than uh, our classical non-disjunction mechanism. And this actually formed the basis of two uh, publications, the first Gabriel et al. in 2011, suggesting that precocious separation was about 11 times more likely, and Alan Handicide et al. a year later, that suggested it was about 20 times more likely. The small chromosomes are more prone to error, and one of the things that we could see very clearly was our classical maternal age effect uh, as uh, visualized here. Now, of course, the maternal age effect exists. I don't need to tell you uh, that at all. But nonetheless, there are younger women for whom the, um, th there are larger numbers of um, uh, chromosomal uh, errors and older women for whom there are lesser um, levels of chromosome errors. And if we consider that in this data set, these were the ones that went on to, uh, to lead to live births. Remember, this is a long time ago, this is 2011, we do a lot better now. We, um, there's certainly other things that we can study in terms of chromosomal uh, non-disjunction other than the maternal age effect. Now, another study by Christian Ottolini about six years ago studied um, in a similar sort of way, 27 chromosome segregation errors, finding again, a lot of uh, precocious separation. But in this uh, occasion, a unique pattern of chromosome segregation reminiscent of inverted meiosis that we called reverse segregation. And one of the things that I'd like to do is really just point out that there's an awful lot more we can do through the study of um, uh, the NGS traces from the uh, egg banks, for instance, looking at patterns of recombination and so on. And in this case, uh, this is our classical non-disjunction mechanism here. This is our precocious separation here. And this is reverse segregation. So although it seemed to, um, it in most uh, analyses, it would show that it was normal. If you looked at uh, SNPs, then it suggested that the um, there was precocious separation essentially on both chromosomes. Uh, and essentially for some chromosomes, the, um, uh, the egg was undergoing uh, a meiosis two type uh, segregation pattern in the first meiotic division. Now, we mustn't forget, of course, that the first successful PGTA by comprehensive chromosome screening was bipolar body analysis. This is Simon Fischel's group, 
um, for the couple with um, 13 previous uh, IVF cycles and leading to baby Oliver that you can see in Simon's arms there, which neatly leads me on to PGTA. Now, in the whole panoply of the world of PGT, um, PGTM is, has very little controversy, but nonetheless, we can use a chromosomally based mechanisms like um, carrier mapping that cut down on workup time and have been widely adopted such that we have something like um, 20,000 cases worldwide. Um, and there's very little controversy. We have chromosome approaches like uh, PGTSR, which again, there's very little controversy. More controversy around the screening of polygenic disorders, but also considerable and ongoing controversy around PGTA, which was formerly known as PGS. And that's what I'm gonna concentrate most of my talk on. So to give you an, an historical background of uh, PGTA, formerly known as PGS, then we can do any one of our types of biopsy here, uh, polar body, blastomere, or trophectodome. In the past, we used to splat our cells down onto a glass slide and use fish. Um, more recently, however, we adopted a ray CGH. I showed you a trace of that a moment ago. And then more recently again, next generation sequencing, and I mentioned a moment ago, SNP chip analysis and carrier mapping, which can also be useful. Who is it for? Well, the most common referral category is advanced maternal age, but it's also used for patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, recurrent implantation failure, and male factor infertility. Now, some um, groups have suggested that ultimately we should be using it for all IVS cycles. But why the controversy and what are the issues surrounding it? Well, I think the first is what I will refer to as stubborn people. And I'm going to go into this in somewhat more detail. But the reason that stubborn people exist is that there are, and this particular issue is that there are issues surrounding mosaicism, whether biopsy uh, damages uh, the cell, how we interpret the data, particularly that of the randomized controlled trials, and the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, the, the regulator in the UK, uh, have recently introduced a, introduced a traffic light system for PGTA and other uh, adjunct treatments for um, uh, IVF. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Which leads me on to this. What on earth am I talking about in these two, uh, uh, two terms that normally find their way into the psychological literature, not in the IVF and genetics ones? Well, my starting point is this, and if ever there was a book to read before you die, I would strongly recommend this one. Some of you will recognize the name of the author, Scott Adams. Um, he is the author of the Dilbert cartoons that are very popular in the US. And this book here is called Win Bigly. And essentially it is a, an account of why Donald Trump managed to win the 2016 presidential election. And the reason is, at least according to Scott Adams, is that he appraised on our ability for these two very human traits. The first cognitive dissonance essentially can be described thus. You know, and you believe something, and yet your actions are not only contrary to those beliefs, but you go about and seeking to justify them. So an example might be that you're a smoker, you know that smoking is bad for you. You read the papers, you know that it causes lung cancer and heart disease and emphysema and so on. But not only do you continue to smoke, you do it in such a way that you don't sort of say, well, um, I just accept the risk and I'm gonna keep on, on doing it. But you justify it in such a way to say, well, I had an uncle, Norman, who um, lived to the age of 90 after smoking 20 to 40 cigarettes a day. And you justify it in your own mind. And I think we all do that to some degree. The other one, confirmational bias, is becoming more and more common, particularly in the light of social media. And this is where people just pick only the piece of evidence that they want to believe in order to bolster their own point of view. Now, back in 2017, I introduced these characters. The only thing that's actually true about them um, in the real world is their names. On the left is Jacob and on the right is Giuseppe, and everything else I'm gonna tell you about them is completely false. So in this imaginary world, Jacob hates PGTA and Giuseppe absolutely loves it. Now, you would expect amongst free thinking people a range of points of view. 
Uh, but nonetheless, you would sort of think that there might be some sort of normal distribution, some sort of bell-shaped curve that uh, represents our range of, um, uh, of uh, opinions on many things, including PGTA. And that when we read empirical evidence that um, is against PGTA, we might shift a little bit more towards Jacob. And if we read empirical evidence that supports PGTA, we might shift a little bit more towards uh, Giuseppe. Now, because of things like cognitive dissonance and confirmational bias, what I observe, and I have to say this is not an empirical study, this is just what I think I see by sitting in conference rooms, is that whenever there's an empirical evidence about PGTA, whether it's in support or against it, then it just tends to polarize opinion. So um, it just re reinforces the view of people who liked or didn't like it in the first place. And if you take nothing else from this talk, I'd like you to just try and take on board that this really, as scientists, is not healthy. So why does it happen and how can we get around it? And what is the evidence base that might help us get around it? So I'm going to start with the idea of mosaicism. Now, one of the things I'm going to try and convince you today is that every human embryo is in some way mosaic. Now, in the world of trophectoderm biopsy, which is how most of PGTA is done, we take a five cell sample from a roughly 200 cell embryo. Now, when you do this and all the cells are the same, so let's say all the cells are normal, euploid, or all the cells are abnormal and euploid, you do not have a scooby-doo, you do not have a clue about whether that embryo is mosaic or not. It's a biopsy, it's only five cells. Okay. So if all the cells are the same, you don't know if you'd picked up a sixth cell or a seventh or an eighth or a two hundredth, whether that would be different to the rest of your diagnosis. So your diagnosis is only of your biopsy, not of your embryo. Now, your biopsy therefore is a reasonable proxy, but only that of the mosaicism state of the rest of your embryo. And I like this um, picture that was doing the rounds in social media a little while ago, then it does really depict um, of what social media is. It's a very narrow uh, view and what we'd like to hope that science should be. So we can adapt that a little bit here that if you were looking through the, uh, the window of cognitive dissonance and confirmational bias through a little hole in the wall, you might just say, hey, it's raining and the mosaicism doesn't exist. But if you were the person on the right looking over the wall here, you might get a more balanced view. Now, I have read some studies in which they have taken five cell biopsies from 200 cell blastocysts, and they've looked at a lot of embryos and they have found a proportion of them in which five out of five cells were normal and euploid, and they call that X. They found a proportion in which five out of five cells were aneuploid, but uniformly so, and they call that Z. So therefore, Y is the one in which you see different cells. So let's say you see five normal and one abnormal, or five, uh, sorry, uh, uh, four normal and one abnormal, or for one different type of normal, let's say trisomy 21, and one another different type of normal, let's say trisomy 18. But then they will come out with the phrase, well, the true incidence of mosaicism is y over x plus y plus z times 100%. Now, all I can say to that is as follows. Now, one of the studies that we are just initiating at the moment is my colleague Ben Skinner at the University of Essex has developed just a really quite nice little um, a virtual embryo. And if anybody wants to have a play with this, just drop me an email. And if you want to have one of your students playing on it, uh, great, we can make some, um, some projects out of it. And it tells us how many eight cells we start with, how many are aneuploid. Um, it also tells us how clumped together the aneuploid cells are. Now, in this case, we just ran 300 iterations in which um, there was 20% aneuploidy. So 40 of our cell, 200 cells were aneuploid and the rest were euploid. And when we do this, then um, 
about 105 times, 110 times, we get five out of five normal. Um, most of the time, or more than any other time, we get uh, this sort of mosaicism representing uh, the, the whole of the embryo, but of course, all different types of mosaicism as well. And Lauren Ke Kelly from, uh, from my lab did this. Equally, if the cells, uh, the abnormal cells are more clumped together, and you would expect this if they are arising from a clonal population, then the proportion that represent the, uh, the true case of a, a state of affairs goes down and all the others go up. So um, back in 1992, I submitted my PhD thesis on the basis of a study that we published in 1991. And even then, Back in 1991, um, two cells here, just seeing the, the DAPI image here, uh, switching the filter. So this is real cameras. We can't merge the images back when we were using camera film. But nonetheless, you see each of these has got one fish signal, and that is for the X chromosome. So these are probably male. But in this case here, we've got three um, cells from the same embryo, definitely a male, that one, definitely male, that one. But this one's got two X, X signals not because it's a female, but probably because it, in this case, it's um, uh, an XXY or more likely a tetraploid cell. So when we looked just single color fish, even back in 1991, male embryos, most of the time, of course, we were seeing uh, one, but in a number, we were seeing two. So this, is, as far as I'm aware, was the first uh, report of uh, mosaicism in human embryos. And yes, I really did look that young. And yes, Dagan Wells really did used to have a ponytail. So if we want to say what is the real level of mosaicism, we want to do this accurately, we can look at fish studies, not those one color studies that I was doing back in the 90s, but at least two colors or, or probably more. And then what you would do is say, well, how many chromosomes did we study? And we start with 23 over that number. So if we looked at all um, uh, 23 pairs, then we wouldn't need to divide it by anything except one. But if we looked at say 12 color fish, then we know that we were looking at half the, um, the number of, um, uh, half the, the carrier type and take that into account. Then what mosaicism do we, rate do we see? Um, and then multiply that by um, whatever number we've got. Then we know that fish has an error rate. And we know that there are uh, so-called overlaps. So sometimes that we'd see more than one error, but ne not necessarily spot it. So we can get a reasonable idea by looking back at literature. Equally, with non-next uh, generation genome um, uh, sequencing studies, we can start with y over x plus y plus z times 100%, but then take into account the number of cells in, every, in the embryo that we've looked at, the number of cells that are in our biopsy, and how clumped our aneuploid cells are. Now, I've not done this completely and utterly yet, but we are in the process of doing it. We've done some uh, actually 24 chromosome uh, fish studies. We've done some studies in which we've looked at every single cell um, uh, by NGS and eventually we're getting there. But even when you do all these things together and when you, like I have, been looking at the site genetics of human embryos for over 30 years, considering all the evidence from all the studies, then certainly one interpretation of the evidence is every single human embryo is mosaic. Okay, now if it's mosaic, it is aneuploid. There is no euploid, there is no mosaic or aneuploid. If there is aneuploidy in your embryo, it is, um, uh, it is aneuploid. Whether it's just one cell out of 200, it still has aneuploidy in it. Now we also know that the levels of aneuploidy and the levels of mosaicism are higher at day three than they are at day five. So to put it another way, the human embryo is characteristically diverse it's fluid and it's dynamic. So this idea that we have from textbooks that we have one gamete with 23 chromosomes, um, an egg say, and another gamete with 23 chromosomes, a sperm, they fuse together to form a zygote with 46 chromosomes. And then that embryo is in perpetuity, 46 chromosomes in all the subsequent cells is actually probably not true, okay? It's far more complex than that. And so we should, not be surprised, therefore, um, then when we are transferring embryos in which we've detected mosaicism, so let's say one out of five or two out of five cells are abnormal, the rest are normal, that we get reasonably good pregnancy rates following IVF. And there are a number of studies that demonstrate that. 
So just a thought, and obviously this is an audience that might well say yes to this question. If we are just looking for um, uh, the effects of maternal age, should we only be doing polar body biopsy? Um, now, I'm not saying that I think we should, but it is a thought. Now, even then, when we detect mosaicism, and this is an argument that we should perhaps be doing trophectoderm and not um, uh, polar body biopsy, is that when we, uh, when we do that, then um, if we see some sort of mosaicism, then the implantation rate is less overall, not individually, but overall, if you look at net embryos, that if you had five out of five normal cells. Okay, so if it's less than 50%, the implantation rate is somewhat less than if you saw none. And then if it is uh, more than 50% abnormal, the implantation rate is a little bit less again. So if every human cell has at least one chromosomally abnormal one, so every human embryo has at least one chromosomally abnormal cell in it, what happens to, the, um, to, to those aneuploid embryos? Now, we know that they do improve. We know that the levels of normality go up as the embryo um, uh, develops. So in order to address this question, we did a study. This is in comparison, this is in uh, collaboration with Bill Kearns' uh, lab um, over in the States, in which, um, I, I don't know how, why they were still doing it, but they still were. They were still doing um, cleavage stage biopsy. Now you don't see cleavage stage biopsy very often. So we're lucky to get our, excuse me, to get our hands on this data, but nonetheless, if you made a euploid diagnosis, which you did about half the time in this set of uh, nearly a thousand embryos, then these embryos were allowed to blastulate. And if they blast blastulated, they did uh, blastocyst transfer and they got a 60% nearly pregnancy rate. If however, as was in 30% of the cases, it didn't blastulate, the, uh, the embryo degenerated, it was discarded. If there was an aneuploid diagnosis, however, um, which was slightly over half the cases, then from greater number of the times there was degeneration and the embryo was discarded, but we had the opportunity to look at those 174 out of the 964 embryos uh, in which there was blastulation um, and we could take the embryo apart and take a look at it. And when we did that, then we looked to the inner cell mass, the trophectoderm, peripheral cells surrounding the embryo, these ones here, and also the blastocele fluid. And the bottom line when we did this is when we looked at the inner cell mass, then 57% of the time we saw it had normalized. Okay, so there were, there were normal cells in the inner cell mass mostly. Whereas if we saw an abnormality 41% of the time, it was abnormality of the same chromosome, at least it confirmed our diagnosis with 3% other abnormalities. In the trophecta term, the picture was not dissimilar, but with slightly less normal cells and slightly more um, abnormality to the same chromosome. But where we saw most of the abnormalities, where did these abnormalities go? They went to the peripheral cells surrounding the blastocyst and to the blastocele fluid. So what we think happens is the blastocysts actively expel abnormal cells away from the developing fetus, away from the inner cell mass. Now, I do want to briefly address the question of, can you damage the embryo by biopsying it? So this is a trophectoderm biopsy. And all I have to say to this is that if you ask someone for tricks and tips for doing blastocyst biopsy and doing it well, they will give you a very long list. Now, I do not expect you to be able to read this except to appreciate that it is a very long list. Now, what this says to me is, well, if all those things that you have to do in order to, um, uh, to get it right, it's very easy to get it wrong. So of course, embryo biopsy can damage the embryo if you do it badly. Not only can it cause compromised embryo development, but it can make it more likely for the lab to return an unclear result. So even if you have the most beautiful randomized trial, beautifully designed randomized trial, if you um, do it with a, um, a group of embryos from which you had a very rough embryologist that has been damaging the embryo, then of course it will not show a benefit. 
of PGTA, no matter how um, well designed the trial was. But if you do it well, follow guidance such as these, and the evidence suggests that you should not damage the embryo. And of course, you want to have proper um, uh, EQA. And it does beg the question of the extent to which, in widespread terms, we would ever return to polar body biopsy. Which leads me to the evidence of this. Um, does PGTA work? Um, and well, one of the things that I would entreat anybody to do is to keep looking at the facts. Because when the facts change, what do you do? And the facts have changed over all of these years. Um, the evidence base of P for PGTA is thus. There are about 100 retrospective, mostly single center studies now with a race EGH and NGS, and the majority of them say yes. The pregnancy rate per embryo transfer, it does work. The randomized controlled trials are somewhat mixed. And there is a most recent one that I'm going to talk about in a second in the New England Journal of Medicine last week. There is a non-selection trial out there, which I'm showing the graph of here. These are embryos in blue, in the blue line, that was diagnosed as euploid, prior came pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy, live birth. Okay. These are embryos that were diagnosed as aneuploid, five out of five cell embryos, biochemical pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy, live birth, 0%, 0% if you transfer embryos in a non-selection trial. Not dissimilar studies from my lab using cattle. Now, there are also, also multi-center analyses. So if you look at um, all the embryos transferred in a country or in a state, for instance, then you come up with various multi-center analyses, such as SART. And this is hot off the press. This is something that we published just two or three weeks ago, in which we looked at the, we did a freedom of information request to the, um, uh, the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority for all the pregnancies um, in IVF in general, and PGTA specifically, in 2016 to 2018. These were the pregnancy rates per embryo transferred. Each of these was highly statistically significant, even in the under 35 age groups. The pregnancy rate uh, per cycle started, again, was highly significant, even in the younger age group, which then leads us to the role of our regulators and should they be only considering the randomized controlled trials? Now, of course, randomized controlled trials are necessary to eliminate any question of bias. But equally, if a study is not a randomized trial, we need to very consider very carefully whether bias is, is likely and not just throw it out. Um, now, in this study that I've just shown you, how likely was bias? Okay, well, First of all, we're seeing a very clear age effect, okay? Secondly, we would only see, um, this would, this, these results would only be not due to PGTA if we were inadvertently selecting poor, um, um, poorer prognosis patients in our regular IVF and much better prognosis patients with our PGTA. Now, do we, do better prognosis patients for PGTA? We absolutely do not. If anything, it's the opposite. Now, I mentioned this paper in a New England Journal of Medicine. The headline says PGTA doesn't work, but they use good prognosis patients. The average age was 29, and they only measured cumulative pregnancy rate. So of course, we know that um, PGTA doesn't work for this group. Now, the UK regulator gave PGTA two red lights recently on a part of its website. Okay, so committee considered the evidence base. Um, but when you look very closely, it looked at a lot of uh, adjunct treatments for, P for um, IVF, and there was no provision for uh, having red light. So there was no red green light in their system. They only ever awarded red and yellow lights. They didn't acknowledge the non selection trials. They said, there's no evidence that it's um, uh, effective. Now that's factually incorrect. I've shown you the evidence base. Um, 
And they didn't really bear in mind the cumulative pregnancy rate, if you have a means of selecting your best embryos, will only ever um, give you no evidence. Okay. The other thing that I think is very odd in this case is that the HFEA do license the use of um, PGTA on a different part of its website and yet give it two, uh, two red lights. So I've been addressing them. Um, when I spoke to them, to their credit, they um, removed one of the red lights, they reworded some of their gu guidance and we are in discussions. So what do we tell our patients? Um, we tell them the facts. Many, all human embryos are aneuploid and mosaic, but advanced maternal age, I think the, uh, the case is closed, it works. It works. For the other um, the referral categories, we might be, want to be a little bit more cautious, but consider those non-selection trials. And for routine IVF, well, maybe not yet, but some clinics are doing it routinely, and those traffic lights have been heavily criticized. So to conclude now, what can we all um, agree upon? We can learn a lot from polar body analysis. We don't do cleavage stage biopsy nor fish anymore. PGTA will not increase cumulative pregnancy rate until something new, unless something new comes to light. There's mounting evidence that it can improve pregnancy rate per cycle for embryo transfer, um, time to first pregnancy, miscarriage carriage rate, and the evidence is strongest with the advanced maternal age. We do still need RCTs. Some colleagues may wish to wait for them. The non-selection trials are compelling, not yet for all our VF cases, but it may be coming, but let's not use phrases like no evidence and mosaicism doesn't exist. So for future consideration, this is actually my last slide now. Scientists look for facts, not for the truth. If it's truth you want, try studying philosophy. Facts change with the changing evidence. We've been arguing this for 20 years. Nobody's completely right or wrong. It's okay to have difference of opinion, but let's not have this absolutism. Let's not have the cognitive dissonance the confirmational bias. We need to constantly re-examine uh, our opinions in the light of the evidence and be appreciative that mm -hmm. we might be mistaken. There's more to agree to disagree, than disagree upon. Creamers, screening uh, polar bodies for chromosome abnormalities is a very, very good idea, and it might generate some great research for us. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Griffin. This is wonderful presentation. And what is so valuable that you are connecting so wonderfully and easily scientific experience and the practical recommendations. For I, I'm sure that for all the attendants and specifically for the young doctors and the practitioners who are joining us and who are day to day in their routine practice, it was really, really important. So we will keep, if you may stay with us another 10 to 15 minutes, please. Mm -hmm. So we will uh, move to the question and answers. So I'm sure we have already questions and we will get more. So please, guys, uh, don't hesitate and write the questions to Professor Griffin, specifically as our unique guest this evening. And I am going to share uh, just facts. And of course, this will bring a lot of discussion as well regarding the fact of the um, uh, advanced genetic testing for the oocyte donors. And this is the data which we operate day to day in our practical experience at Ovogene Donor Bank. Uh, and this is just to, to show the facts and to think about. So the fact is that the oocyte donation is an integral part of modern assisted reproductive care, and it is associated with achieving the highest success rates and we know that the globally demand is increasing because the age of our patients is uh, significantly raising up and there are many, many reasons why it is happening. That's why Ovogene Donor Bank has an aim to provide an excellence in oocyte donation care and quality. And we are international egg bank supplying the uh, quality frozen, high quality frozen donor oocytes, sperm and embryos to fertility clinics and, and, and individual patients worldwide. We arrange shipment of all types of the cryopreserved biomaterials to IVF clinics globally. And we have many partners within United Kingdom as well, which is very specific and very demanding market. So the, there is a large selection of the donors in terms of their phenotypes regarding the fact that they could be anonymous or non-anonymous. We provide a full donor screening and we will talk much more about this during uh, my next slides. 
you have heard already our unique service, which I appreciate the um, thoughts of Professor Darren Griffin, that we, which has so much potential in the future as genetically certified oocyte technology with advanced uh, genetic testing for the donors and using artificial intelligence technology on donor oocyte selection, including morphology and categorizing the oocytes into quality one and using them for the further uh, in oocyte banking. As well, we have transparent guarantees and compensation packages for our individual patients and the partners. That's why we would like to be so transparent and, um, and pleasant for our patients because we are plain for the best results. We have free online donor search and convenient process of the donor selection with the help of the personal coordinator support as well the embryological and the laboratory support for partner clinics, as we have different practitioners, have different experience, and we are willing to get the, the highest possible results. That's why we are sharing our practical knowledges and the experience with showing results, audits, and the analysis constant, as well as safe and hand-carried biological material transportation from door to door, which is part of the process. You can see in green the map of those countries uh, marked to where the oocytes are traveling from uh, origin donor bank. And just since the COVID started and the global epidemic, which uh, we were thinking will, will stop our activities, but it raised the demand. Uh, and while being creative and flexible and also corresponding to the regulations of the international uh, association and um, uh, the guidelines, we are able to keep supply uh, highest quality biological materials worldwide. How we select our donors? Uh, according to Ukrainian law and based on the good clinical practice experience, the age of our donors is between 18 to 30 years old. They are in their perfect physical and mental health, thoroughly screened. We do not exhibit the detriment, they do not have detrimental habits or addictions. They all have proven fertility, and this is a benefit of Ukrainian oocyte donation, as only few countries in the whole world uh, are requesting proven fertility for their donors. Uh, our donors have no hereditary illnesses and negative phenotypical signs. So we will talk more about donor selection in terms of the laboratory tests, which include viruses uh, and critical infections and whole hormonal profile, as well as the consultation of the gynecologist, uh, GP, pelvis scan, breast scan, and psychological evaluation. In terms of the genetic testing, by law in Ukraine, there is requested only karyotyping. But as a, a prevalence of, the, of being carriers of uh, mutations for the cystic fibrosis, phenylketonuria, neurosensory deafness, as a good clinical practice recommendation, as a decision also of our management and the scientific team, we are testing all our donors for 14 mutations. And the um, exception rate for those donors being tested for 14 mutations, including 11 mutations of the cystic fibrosis, has been 4.6%. And we will talk lately uh, about the expanded genetic testing. However, let's start from the genetic counseling. And the genetic counseling process for each donor at Ovogen Donor Bank include interpretation of family and medical histories to assess the chance of the disease's occurrence or occurrence, three generation pedigree to the donor and its analysis, genetic screening recommendation by the geneticist, tests, as I mentioned, for the list of those mutations, extended genetic testing for the special cohort of the donors, and we will share the data and the results of being positive and uh, we, the, the thoughts uh, related to this, genetic test results and reputation and result. And also we store the DNA for all our donors for potential further use. And if any questions will occur to have an answer. So we know that the development and thank you for the chronology of this development to Professor Darren Griffin, that uh, within starting in 1970, 
when we just started to talk about the genetics and its testing until today, while we are talking about full genome sequencing, this is a great achievement. And we changed a lot of gold, so-called gold standards, and probably there is a room for changing even more. But if we are talking about carrier testing and the number of tests, you can definitely make a correlation that more we test, more we will get positive for. And this is also the X-link disorders, which are so important. I would like you to, to check and compare the diagnosis of the minimum panel of 47 as recommended for the carriers and some banks are doing this and they just have recently published and the number of donors being positive carriers with the panel of 47 disease is 17%. And the uh, advanced genetic testing and screening, including 21 X-link disorders and over 280. And as in our panel, which we, we are experiencing right now for testing of our donors, 302 mutations. So the number of X-link is 21. So this is the data which is coming from testing already more than 100 of donors from our database that no mutations were found in the examined population of proven donors being proven having their child, at least one child born as their own was 14%. 14% in the population that they are not carers at, at least like no disease. And uh, you can see here in the previous slides, the critical, so-called considered critical mutations, including the cystic fibrosis extended uh, testing and some others and non-critical mutations where the hemochromatosis and the neurosensory deafness were the leading mutations, which were testing as positive. And this is the quantity of the donors with one, uh, as being a carrier of one condition, it's 35%, carriers of two conditions, 70, 62%, three conditions, 18 and four conditions, 24%. And non, being non-carriers, just 14%, as I mentioned previously. This is a frequency and the spectrum of the gene mutations among the donor or uh, the population for those who are interested more deeply in those results and the distribution of gene mutations among the oocyte donors. So as we know, the single gene disorders are really common and they are medically significant. Uh, they are even more common than the Down syndrome. And 20% of the infant death, death and 10% of the pediatric hospitalization are due to single gene conditions. Around one to 2% of couples are at risk of having a child with the recessive, recessive condition. It considered as low, however, we all understand that while we are aiming for the good clinical practice and the excellence in the oocyte donation, we would like to avoid even those risks. Also autosomal recessive and X-link uh, diseases. So while there is a 25% chance that the couple carrying an autosomal recessive condition will have an affected child, and there is a 50% chance that even a son of the woman carrying an X-link condition will be affected. Within a world, there is, there is a discrepancy and the large variation between the guidelines and the regulations in place regarding the use of the donors who are the carriers or they're in the family, there is a history. In UK and Denmark and Germany, such donors are recommended to be excluded and um, they are rejected from the first donations. I just will remind you, and regarding the cystic fibrosis, that around 80% of children with cystic fibrosis are born to parents with no family history of the cystic fibrosis. So there is taking into account the fact that having advanced genetic testing of over 300 mutations, and getting, of course, this is not a huge data. This is just a little bit more than 100 donors being tested, but 86% of those are carriers of the genetic conditions. So, so if the recommendations will be still in place to exclude those donors from the further donation, we can just imagine what would be the 
the possibility of, of the nation to be present in the world. Um, and then there is a decision and there should be a decision or the recommendations regarding the, the screening of the couple. So there is an opportunity of the concurrent screening. So the same screening being performed for the donor and the patient, the male peri patient at the same time. However, if we are talking about outside banking where patients are coming already to get a, a fast decision and the fast results. So we keep constantly available. And right now we have over 8,000 oocytes immediately available, but just part of those donors are advanced genetically tested. So the conditions in order to be matched, it will take time until the, the male partner will get their results done. So there is another possibility of sequential screening. So while the donor is negative, so there is no necessary to test the partner. However, for those donors who are positive, not to exclude them from the further donations, but test the partner and perform the matching. Definitely this will avoid the risks and it will bring us to the healthy outside donation and the good clinical practice experience. So to conclude, the outside banking is the best solution for effective outside donation treatment. Effective implementation of the outside vitrification has made it possible to discover new therapeutic opportunities in reproduction. The use of the vitrified oocytes can be considered as a new global standard in reproduction. It is true that more we test, more we will uh, get us being positive as well as the donor considering being a healthy cohort and with the proven fertility. So this is the fact which we are experiencing right now. So developments of the recommendations, but global recommendation, not just similar for each location and each country, and then to, to try to, to be on between or to suit to everyone, it should, should be developing. And this is the, the future. So thank you so much. And um, this is what we were planning to talk with you today regarding the genetic testing. And I would like to open the uh, discussion and uh, happy to ask the, the questions which have been given before already. And you can keep writing your questions uh, in the... Uh, communicating platform. So I have one question before I will get into my questions in the list. Professor Darren Griffin, what do you think regarding the future of IVF in general? So I am amazed with your chronological photos of uh, three locations and these are different periods. We are not that experienced. However, being a practical doctor, we remember that time starting from the long protocol and RCG as a triggering and those, you know, complications with the OHSS and a lot of topics of how to avoid, how to make it safe, etc. So a lot of changes. So from your great experience, what is the nearest future and what is the future you would like to have for the reproduction? Yeah, it, it really is a weird one because it, it's um, the world is is going more and more into regulation. I mean, there's no it, it, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and, and yet um, when it gets to the point where regulation starts to stifle innovation, then it's getting it somewhat wrong. And um, one of the things I've been trying very hard to do with the um, HFEA this year um, is to just try and take a slightly more pragmatic view to the evidence base and to try and put the empower the patients a little bit more. So if you give the patients the, you know, the, the, the full facts about the, um, uh, the, the evidence base, um, uh, then allow them to make their own decisions a little bit. So. I imagine that we'll see a little bit more of that. I think we um, uh, the current situation can't go on with um, a, you know it's not like the COVID vaccine, for instance. That um, you know after after a, a certain um, you know 
small amount of time. The procedure is very simple. You stick a needle in someone's arm and that's it. Um, IVF is not a simple procedure. It's got all those little things. And I think we can't, we can't classify that this works and that works and, and so on quite so simply because it depends how well someone is, is doing it. So although I think we will see more regulation, I think we will um, also start to see some sort of um, loosening off in the sense of um, not demanding the, the evidence of randomized trials the whole time. I think um, we, we, we've got to do a little bit more of that. Um, in terms of technological in innovation, I think I was very interesting with what Birol was saying about um, uh, artificial intelligence. I think we'll see a lot more of that. Um, I, I think we'll, um, I, I think observational uh, approaches to, to staying what is the, um, uh, the best embryo supported by um, uh, machine learning, I think is probably the way forward. So all of those things, but, but more regulation, I'm afraid. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. This is something what we would will to hear practicing in Ukraine, you know, where we are allowed to, to have a trial. We yes. just need to sign a consent with the patient that yeah. she allows us to make a trial while we are taking care of her safety. And, you know, there is an explanation that 43 years ago, there was a first IVF, which was a trial. So wh where we are all today. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. this confirms the fact that, but yes, agree for the regulations, of course. So we have a question from the chat. Is there as an established pattern of aneuploidy distribution in blastocyst from Ikerira? Ikerika, sorry. Um, that's, I think that's one of my students, actually. Um, is there an established pattern of chromosome abnormalities? Um, and they avoided the distribution in blastocysts, yeah. Yeah, so in, in blastocysts, um, well, in uh, if we start with eggs, then um, certainly the, um, the smaller chromosomes seem to non-disjoin more. That also seems to be the case in sperm. Um, I've not seen amongst... Um, we, we're trying to analyse some of the mosaic data from um, Andrea Victor um, uh, in Manuel Viotti's lab and also um, Antonio Capalbo. And i am it's not looking that obvious. It's not as clear cut as the meiotic errors for the, for the smaller chromosomes. But I think, um, um, so I, I think it's, it's relatively random for, for post-zygotic errors, but um, non, random for um, uh, for meiotic errors, I think is the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And another question from the private chat, I think it's from the doctor, because it, there is a question regarding, would you recommend to have a trial of the treatment for the patient who is 45 years old and she's insisting on having her own baby? So would you do a trial in 45 year olds? Um, I think someone will uh, one of these days. And I think as, um, as people, you know, they're, they're, uh, they get um, biologically younger and fitter. Um, and, and, you know, um, when you think back to not that long ago, you know, our grandparents' generation, then, um, it wouldn't have been a very good idea to have a child at 45, A, because your body wouldn't be very equipped for it, um, because, you know, you, you'd eaten badly and smoked a lot of, I'm, 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 I'm uh, you know, I'm generalizing. Uh, and also you might not live to see that, that um, child um, develop at all. You know, you, you might be, um, by the time they're 15 years old, you know, you're passing 60 and, and you know, with severe health problems. Now, given that society is changing in such a way that um, it's becoming the only issue that we can't seem to crack is the maternal age effect for um, uh, chromosome segregation. I think it starts to become inevitable that if, um, uh, if women's bodies are genuinely just as equipped, um, you know, the, um, th they are fit and healthy enough, and the endometrium is, is healthy enough, then I think it starts to become inevitable that you're going to be looking at trials to say, well, um, 
can we mitigate for the maternal age effect by PGTA? Or indeed, can we find the mechanisms through which the abnormalities occur in the first place? So, you know, if you're giving more someone more vitamin D, um, for instance, and, um, you know, can you make their eggs so that they don't um, segregate their chromosomes quite so badly as in the, the eggs of most 45-year-olds uh, right now? Um, and of course, looking at um, a lot of egg bank data might just help us do that. Yeah, yeah. So continuously the question regarding the age, what is your thought regarding the um, printing the ovaries or growing the ovaries from the stem cells? Mm -hmm. Do you expect this to happen soon? And being, becoming a, like, this is a question also related to me, like how long do you believe outside the nation will still exist or we will find an alternative? Yeah, um, I mean, as with all alternatives, I think they, they find their place, but they're actually quite rare that they completely take over uh, the practice of, um, um, you know, so, so I can't see egg banking going away anytime soon um, for all sorts of reasons. I think, you know, there will be a certain uh, subset of patients for which stem cells are, um, you know, uh, really very important, but it's an incredibly involved procedure compared to, um, uh, you know, to uh, super ovulating what someone and storing their eggs, you know, this is, uh, uh, it requires an awful lot more steps. So I think that would be the limiting factor in a way that yes, it will be there, but I, 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 I don't think you'll be, uh, I don't think you'll be out of a job um, in the next 10 years, Juliana, I say. <laughs> We are really busy, not only with the egg banking, however, yes, this is the, yeah, the, the, the preference, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and the question regarding, um, do we test, do you test your donors prior to, like, you're getting the consent, and do you inform them regarding the genetic conditions founded? So, yes, we are signing the consent with all of our donors who are going to be tested for extended genetic testing, even prior to the testing to fragile X and the, the cystic fibrosis, what we do uh, routinely for all of our donors. And here we have a data for over than 4,000 donors being screened. Uh, however, yes, for the extended genetic, we inform them regarding the conditions only if they sign the consent that they would like to be informed. If they don't, uh, we keep it as a medical secret. So these are all questions from the audience for today. And I would like to thank you all. Professor Griffin, this is our great pleasure. Thank you for being you with much. us for the second time. And unfortunately, it's again, second time not in presence. And I wish that we will meet finally in the new year. Yes. And I wish you the happy Merry Christmas. And especially because we are together in this uh, wonderful season of the holidays. Thank you for your time, for all your efforts. Again, we are so satisfied with the lecture, being so open and so easy accessed by, by all individuals who are present right now here. And we will be happy to continue our communication, scientific cooperation and all the future developments. Thank you for your role. I know you are busy again with the lab and probably making X or biopsy or something right now, but uh, for sharing all your experience and finding the time for everything. Thank you for all the audience for being with us and we will be back very soon. However, it will be already a new year and I wish you all the, the great health, happiness, love and the, the opportunities in your life every day uh, as a huge development of your professional and the personal life. Thank you so much. Anything from you, Professor Griffin? No, just to say Merry Christmas, everyone, or um, however you choose to celebrate in this um, in this season. And um, I even wore the jumper for you. Look, there we go. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Stay Take safe. Care. Goodbye. Bye.